Hey, everybody. It's Larry Berman here. It never seems to be a shortage of interesting things to have a look at. Let's dive into the chart room and see what we learned this week. So what did we learn on the economic calendar this week? Well, this is the uh, Citibank Economic Surprise Index. And we commented a few weeks ago how the index has, has shot up and we, we showed you a, a very long-term uh, view of the index. And when the surprise, level of uh, economic surprises got up into these levels historically, we started to see, um, let's say, over-optimism. Um, by economists starting to expect more than actually came. And so this week we actually saw some disappointments. So uh, we saw uh, stronger than expected claims numbers, meaning stronger, meaning more, more let few, fewer unemployment claims. So the expectation in recent weeks, claims started to ticking up. Now they're ticking back down. So from a market perspective, that's a negative. We've seen the reaction in the fixed income market swinging around dramatically based on recession, not a recession, steepening yield curve, flattening yield curve, Fed tightening, Fed easing. Um, and and that narrative is going to be forefront, you know, right through Jackson Hole, which we see at the end of um, August. Obviously, this week is the Fed meeting. Virtual uh, lock in terms of expectations 96 percent chance of a rate hike this week and you can see looking out possibility of a rate hike but really the market saying no this is probably one and done we probably will see the last rate hike here it's all going to depend on the data and that's just why the market is doing what it's doing and so when we get these economic surprises plus and minus it moves the bond market around and 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 basically um, that's kind of the focus uh, right now. So we're in earnings season, uh, but on, on options expiry this Friday, we also had a significant rebalancing of the NASDAQ 100 and everybody will know that by now. One of the stocks in our portfolio that we had been accumulating over the last, call it year, at an average price of below $5, at the start of the week was was a little bit below on average where we had purchased it. Um, and when the announcement came out and the expectations for rebalancing, Sirius Satellite was one of the heaviest shorted interest stocks and so this stock was going to increase by about that much, but net it was going to mean something like $90 million worth of net buying. So as we got closer to rebalancing at the close on Friday, which we're sitting in front of right now, you can see the shock that hit uh, on Thursday. I, I think, I, and I don't know for fact, but I expect... Uh, that that rebalancing process took place over two days as opposed to waiting to do it very late in the day um, on Friday. So, so obviously some front running, some speculation on what that might mean. That ha big part of that happened Thursday. Uh, so what did we do? We, we sold our exposure in the stock, having accumulated it down at these levels and wrote puts because volatility premium is very high to acquire that stock. Again, back below $5, we wrote December puts to buy Sirius at five. I think we got 75 cents for them. So net buy would be about four and a quarter, um, you know, given where it's trading today. And we dumped our longs at an average somewhere around $7. So, you know, the rebalancing, if you look at the impact the names that were most negative are the big price ones. So Meta, Netflix, NVIDIA, obviously Netflix this week, uh, bad on, on the earnings front. Um, we, we also uh, had some negative news from Tesla on the earnings front. So the ones that had been net to be net sellers, Apple, Microsoft, those are all weaker as we head to the close on Friday. And the, all the ones that are going to be the big positives, Qualcomm being the, one of the largest ones, Broadcom being another that was going to see the net dollars flowing in. Again, index is behaving as, as expected. 
So if you look at, you know, what's going on overall, you can see that. So is is this um, the peak for the index or is this just noise? You know, if I knew the answer to that, I'd have all the money in the world. And, and clearly I don't. So we don't know. But when we look at the stock or the, the ETF here and we look at the levels we're at, we're not quite at the all time highs, but really, really close. If we look at an RSI chart on a weekly basis and we look at the price behavior this week, we, we clearly get the sense of resistance. But again, is this the index rebalancing or is this a meaningful top? So how do you know? Well, you, you kind of get the sense from looking at some of the leadership names. So here's another ASML that was a net beneficiary this week of a flow going in i believe the number was somewhere around 330 million they reported earnings a couple of days ago they beat earnings but had some negative guidance the stock sold off not surprisingly we get a little bid today again why because that this is a name that's going to net attract some buying today in the index but the guidance was negative and i would suspect here a lot of this move up here into earnings is going to easily be retraced and reversed. This stock could easily come back down to 600. Again, this is a leadership name in the uh, microchip space, the semi space, and thought to be it's not an AI play by any stretch of the imagination, but their technology certainly supports the advanced chip making uh, and manufacturing. Uh, so, you know, interesting to see what ends up here uh, this week. And if we should see this name start to weaken off again, it would tell us a little bit about the fundamentals here, uh, further giving support to the idea that maybe the Qs at least have reached some sort of a, a peak here uh, with all the good news and Microsoft and Apple and everybody else telling you uh, in, in this past week or week and a half about what their AI uh, plans are. When we look at liquidity, uh, this is gonna be the next thing. Again, Fed this week, will they talk about the balance sheet and the runoff? I don't know, but this week we did see the balance sheet of the Fed come back down to the lowest levels of the year. And remember, we, we had that adjustment uh, off the banking crisis that was not really QE, but it was another program that allowed assets to get onto the Fed's balance sheet um, as the lender of last resorts to help facilitate um, or mitigate, if you will, is a better word, um, the banking crisis and 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 liquidity around um, what banks would need to do to uh, to get through that. So that that's a big. Uh, focus on on the week. We know the Treasury General account was generally refunded through most, if not all, the money coming out of the repo market. So we've seen a big move down as bill issuance shot up significantly in recent weeks. So August 2nd, we get the refunding announcement uh, and a composition. So July 31st. So, uh, you know, a Basically, we're, we're, we're almost there just after the Fed meeting in terms of the amount uh, that's going to be need to refund it over the next quarter quarterly refunding calendar. And then on August 2nd, we get the composition. If Yellen decides to fund more through bills than repo. So right now, about 80 percent of the debt issuance is coupon, meaning bonds, not bills, bonds and higher two years and higher coupon versus money market bills and lower one year and lower um, 80 20. So if that split is maintained for the quarterly refunding announcement, we're going to need to to raise about four hundred and fifty billion dollars worth of coupon bonds. And if that is the case, we expect pressure to build on longer term interest rates and middle term interest rates. And that should again, be another breaking factor in terms of sucking liquidity out of markets because bond yields will have to back up 
the higher bond yields are, the, the worse the discounting mechanism for the multiple is. And with the stock market trading at pretty much perfection, Goldilocks type numbers, um, if we see bond yields start to tick up because supply is coming and it's massive supply over the next year that they're going to need to help pay for QT, that balance, that balance sheet shrinkage and the deficit spending that is, you know, uh, virtual certainty in the years to come. Uh, that should put some upward pressure on interest rates. Make no mistake, guys, despite the fact that interest rates cuts are priced in, if we don't get a harder landing to the economy, in my mind and in many others, there's no chance of them cutting rates next year. So at some point, yes, but it demands a hard landing. They are certainly not going to do it with the S&P 500 firing on all cylinders. That ease will not come. That ease will get priced out of equities when there's stress in equities and we start to see job losses. That to me is when the Fed is able to ease. We, we need that in order for inflation to come down. The argument that inflation's coming down to me, again, happy to have that debate out there. And I know it's raging right now between the disinflation camp and the sticky camp. I'm in the sticky camp. Anyways, fe- uh, folks, have a great week. There's no bull and bear pick of the week. You know our thoughts here. Be very, very cautious on markets.